Well, good morning, Victory Church. How are you? Praise God. Praise God. I am wonderful. Thank you. Praise God. Well, this morning we are going to get right into it. We're going to be in our second week of the series, A Call to Arms. And as I shared last week, if you were not here, I encourage you, go online, uh, victorychurchmo.com, and listen to last week's message, very powerful, um, how we talked about, and we're going we're gonna to continue in the series today, how we talked about that the, when we're talking about a call to arms, in our, if you see this graphic, you recognize that it's not traditionally what the, the, the world's understanding of a call to arms means. Call to arms in, in our understanding today, in, in, our, in, in our world, in the world, it's about gathering up your weapons and getting ready for some kind of political unrest and warfare. But Jesus has called us to arms, and it looks very different than the, what the world calls us to. Jesus is calling us to his arms because his call to arms was when he, he stretched his arms on the cross. And he gave his life for humanity where sin was ravaging humanity. Sin was ravaging uh, souls and, and people were careening toward their eternal doom. And Jesus stepped out of heaven and took what I deserved, took what you deserved, Sin that separated us from God. And if, you don't, if you've not heard that word sin before, if you don't understand what sin is, sin is, is anything that separates us from God. Sin are decisions, it's the decisions that we make, attitudes of our hearts, um, anything, anything that separates us from God. And the confusion sometimes with the world is that it, it is, when, is when you don't know Jesus and they say, well, I'm a good person. So I can't understand how, how be being a good person will, will keep me from, from being in God's presence or keep me from, what we, from heaven. But the Bible's very clear that none of us, no matter how good we perceive ourselves in our eyes or how good we see other people from our own perspective, none of us are good enough to be in God's perfection. So God had a way out for us, and that was Jesus Christ, where he came, stepped into humanity, stepped out of heaven, being fully God, took on the form of, of man, and gave his life for us, washed away our sin if we choose to say yes to Jesus. So Jesus' call to arms is saying, will you love the way I love? So last week we talked about loving your neighbor, and we looked in Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. And we know that from that story, from that account, Jesus gave this example, well, the, the, uh, a lawyer, an expert in the law of God. Not what we're talking about a lawyer today. A today's lawyer is an expert in their field of law, of their field of practice. An, a lawyer, uh, an expert in the law, in the, in the New Testament or in the Bible, when we're talking about that, is an expert in the law of God. So this person challenges Jesus and says, and it was, there, was always, there were always intellectuals, there were always religious people, there was always people trying to challenge Jesus and trip him up. Ask him the question. And Jesus, and he asked him the question about, about uh, you know, how must I get into the kingdom of God? And, he's, and Jesus challenges him, what's, what's the, the Bible says? says, love God, love your neighbor. So then he challenges him and he says, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus gives the story of the good Samaritan. And I gave you three imperatives to loving your neighbor. Is first recognize the need. So we looked quickly, and I'm not going to re-preach the message, but just the, just the synopsis. Last week we had a Samaritan who, in this story, first you have a priest that sees the man beaten on the side of the road, and it was probably a Jewish man. So the very people that he was called to minister to, he saw this person on the road beaten on the side of the road, and and to avoid this person or to having to engage this person, walks across the road and goes in the complete, as far away from him as, as he could. And then it says a Levite comes along. A Levite is also from the line of Levi, but not from, the, from, the, from Aaron's line of Levi. So wasn't a priest, but was, was a temple worker. So another minister. Another minister comes by, sees the man beaten. It's probably a Jewish man. We don't know for sure. The story doesn't say that, but we can, we can extrapolate that from the scriptures and we can see it's probably a man that he was called to minister to, sees the man beaten, left for dead, crosses the street and avoids him. Then comes along this Samaritan. 
Now, you have to understand a Samaritan was what they called. You don't want to talk about racism, and you want to, it, it does, it, it's not new to us. Back then, the Jews considered the Samaritans half breeds, they treated them terribly, awful. So you have this person who sees somebody who, who, has, who has systematic hatred toward him and everybody he knows and everybody he loves and his whole community of people is lying there half dead on the floor. What does he do? He recognizes that there's a need and he goes and he helps the person. So the two ministers who were called to minister to a group of people specifically avoids that person, avoids the challenge, doesn't recognize the need or avoids the need. And you have here, this person, a cast out of society that recognizes the need. The second imperative to loving your neighbor was to become a safe haven. So in this story, the Samaritan took this man, this probably this Jewish man who was left for dead, and took him to an inn. And I describe that an inn in, in this time in history, in the ancient world, was a, a place of, of refuge, was a place of, of safe haven for travelers. So you have to understand that there wasn't the mass transportation system that we know now and the highway system. And, and even back here in the rural part of the world, <laughs> the rural part of America, it's still not even close to what it was like traveling. It's not even in the, in the stratosphere of what it was like traveling in these days. So they did it by foot. It was often rocky, uh, treacherous terrain, followed by the exposure to wild animals, it was the exposure to bandits, the exposure to all kinds of, of hazards. So there were these inns that were set up that all kinds of, of nefarious characters would stay at, but this was a safe haven for travelers. So they wouldn't be exposed, so they wouldn't be vulnerable. And I believe... Jesus was using this, and as you study the scriptures, you will see that the inn is what the church should be. We are the church because the Holy Spirit lives within us, those that have given their lives to Jesus. So we are to be a safe haven as well as the buildings that we occupy should be a safe haven for people. doesn't matter if they're part of the family of God or if they're not. It doesn't matter. We should be a safe haven, and God is calling us to be a safe haven. That's part of the call to arms. This is Jesus. You look at the life of Jesus when he was on this earth. He was, his arms were stretched out long before he took, he went up to the cross, and he was embracing people, the cast outs of society, those that were struggling, those that were hurting, those that knew so much. Jesus embraced everyone and became a safe haven to humanity. The third imperative we talked about last week, was be prepared to pay. There's a cost to following Jesus. And so in this story, the, the good Samaritan put the, the man that was left half dead to get him to the inn and take care of him. He, first of all, he, he dressed his wounds. He took care of him. He used his own resources to do that. He put him on his own animal and walked beside the animal, gave him transportation, and then brought him to the inn, the safe haven, head to the innkeeper, Listen, here's the money for his stay. Make sure he's fed. Make sure he's, he's taken care of. Give him what he needs. And if there's more required, more cost, I will come back and I will pay. Just take care of him. We often forget. We talk about the blessing of God, and there is the, there is the, the I believe, the, the false gospel that, that we, we often refer to as the, um, the, prosper, the, the, the gospel of prosperity, the prosperity gospel. Boy, I was a little tongue-tied there. And we say, well, when you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus wants you to be, and we, we associate everything with wealth and resources. And we miss what the blessing of God is. The blessing of God is to be free from our sin, free from eternal damnation, free from the weight and the bondage of the cares of this life, and part of that could be resources. Part of that could be, could be finances. Part of that could be success in business and in career. And that's all part of it. But that is, in and of itself, is not what Jesus is talking about with being blessed. And we see that we have to understand that there's a cost to following Jesus. The cost is, first of all, our devotion to him, our life, that, we are, that we've pledged our life to him, that he is to rule our life. So in other words, I'm, I'm unseating myself from the throne of my life and I'm seating Jesus on the throne of my life so that not my will, God, your will be done. We 
We have to be prepared. So Jesus tells us, tells us to daily pick up our cross and follow him. So this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10 again. And I want to talk to you about worship. Worship. So when I'm talking about taking up arms, it's, it's very important that we understand what worship is. Worship is so often confused with praise. Praise is the outward expression of our worship. Praise is, how, is, 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 us, is our de declaration, lifting our hands. It's the outward expression of what God is doing in our hearts. It's the outward expression of our, of our devotion to God. That's praise. Worship is, somebody said this once and it just stuck, is, is worth-ship. Is what do we ascribe worth to? What do we put our worth toward? What has our heart, what has our attention? That is worship. That is worship. So as we talk about in our, in our discipleship series and, and when we take people through follow or you go through follow that, our discipleship book, there is a, there is a passage in there as learn, what it means to learn to follow Jesus. And we talk about worship. And specifically, we say that as a follower of Jesus Christ, everything we do as a follower of Jesus is worship. And that sometimes it blows people away because we, so everything that we're doing, not just what we do together on Sunday morning, but driving my car is worship. Interacting with people is worship. Paying my bills is worship. Being a faithful steward. The Bible says steward is a manager. That is worship to God. How we live our lives is worship. Everybody is worshiping something. See, we don't often look at it that way because we ascribe worship to praise. So we're always looking at, at worship as, as idolatry where we're on our face worshiping a golden uh, calf or we're on our face worshiping uh, 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 things made of wood and, and stone, and, uh, a physical idol. But what we don't understand is that modern day idolatry, which is just like old world idolatry, are the very things that has a hold of our hearts that we give worth to. So it has our attention. So they could be very good things in this life, very profitable things, very, very, very good things that, that are, that are uh, part of the blessing of God. But if we give that all of our worth, if we ascribe so much worth to that and it has the majority of our heart and our attention, it becomes an idol in our lives. So this morning we're going to look at Luke chapter 10 and we're going to talk about part of the call to arms being worship. And this is a passage of scripture that maybe you're not... Maybe it's going to be a new, a new look at it today. Beginning in verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who, had the, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And you're probably thinking, what in the world does this have to do with worship? Well, I'm glad you asked, rhetorically, of course. I'm going to give you three keys this morning. Number one is be available. Be available. We see right there in verse 38, uh, uh, they were on their way. This was Jesus and the band that was following, particularly his disciples, the ones that he, was, he had with him. Jesus entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Martha was available. See, we often talk about the latter part of Scripture, but we miss the part that Martha was available. Martha saw Jesus, saw that he was traveling, saw that he was there to minister to us, uh, minister to the people there, recognized him being the Son of God and everything that God was doing, whether she realized he was a, he was a powerful teacher or a prophet or the, she had an understanding that he was a Son of God. The Scripture's not clear, but she recognized who he was. She recognized that there was a need. We talked about that last week, and she was open to him. She was open to God. She was open to Jesus, so she made herself available. And she made her possessions available and her skills and her talents available. Now, we just talked about worth. Being available is acknowledging God's worth. Being available for Jesus, being available for the things of God, being available for the people who need Jesus is ascribing worth, is 
uh, is declaring your worth, is acknowledging God's worth. He wants our attention. He wants our, he wants our individuality. He wants, uh, individually rather, he wants us individually to acknowledge his worth. He wants us to acknowledge his worth in our marriages. He wants, God wants us to acknowledge his worth in our, in our families, in the lives of our children, in the lives of our grand, your grandchildren. I almost said our, not yet. I'm not speaking prophetically. In the lives of our grandchildren. Oh, that threw me there. I squirreled right there, folks. <laughs> in the lives of, 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 of our church, in our church. We need to make ourselves available to God, and that acknowledges not only his worth to us, but acknowledges to everyone else God's worth to us. I think so many times we, we make ourselves not available, and we often excuse it, because of the most common thing, and that's busyness. But what we're doing is those things that are, that are stealing our time or the things that are consuming our time, those things that we say make us busy, we are ascribing more worth to those things than to God. But how can that be? How, 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 how could you say those things? There's things we need to do. I need to go to work, and I need to, I need to provide for my family, and I need, to, I need to do this, and I need to do Yes, absolutely. But do those things have all of your attention? So I think of, I think of the psalmist. It's David where he says, in the morning when I rise, he's with God. He's in, so in the, the first thing on his lips is, is God. He wants to be in God's presence. He wants God's blessing on his life. He wants God's anointing to flow through his life. And that's, that's, that's what that is acknowledging. He, what he's doing is acknowledging God's worth to him and how valuable God is to him in his life and even his dependency on God for the very things that he's about to endure or encounter or face that day. But what we do is we... Is we set God aside, and we try to, let's say we're, we're believers and we understand the value of, of daily time with God, because we've been talking about it for the last three years, plus hopefully your whole life as a believer. But what we do is we schedule God, and there, there's a time for, your, for that quiet time that we call, or that prayer time, or the, the time where you study the word. That's, that's good that you schedule that. But what we do is we, we schedule it and we set it aside like, that's right here on the calendar, so I'm checking that box, and you've heard me talk about this before, that we're checking a box, and then that's for that time, but not for every other time, and we're missing the fact that when we acknowledge God's worth in our lives, when we make ourselves available, whether it's in our prayer time or that schedule time, or it's in our time where we're driving to work, or we're pumping gas, or we're at work, or we're talking to uh, 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 our friends, or we're engaging in... in, in, in uh, Whatever it is we're doing, we're at the sports with our kids. At the sports, my goodness. At one point, <laughs> we're, we're at games for our kids. It's like the internet. <laughs> or the Facebook. We need to acknowledge God's worth in all of those things. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ. So where we go, the presence of God goes with us. So as we acknowledge God's worth, if we make ourselves available in every moment of our lives, and that's just being in the state of awareness, being the state of readiness, being open, we are ascribing God's worth to every part of our lives, every fabric of our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible tells us, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So this is speaking directly to those followers of Jesus Christ. This is speaking to the church. This is speaking to us. Not to a lost and dying world. This is speaking to us. It's saying that we are, have been chosen because God gave, Jesus gave his life for us. So we, having responded to Jesus Christ, having given our lives to Christ, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, which means we stand in royalty to do the work of God. Priesthood meaning we are to minister, to, uh, to, uh, we are ministers 
in the royal priesthood. We are ministers for God, a holy nation, a nation that is set apart, a people that are set apart. And, and he says, who has called you a people of his own possession. So we're set apart for God. We are his possession. We belong to God. And that is not some kind of thing that we should look at in a negative light. That is a thing that, that we should look at in a positive light, that our heavenly father has drawn us to himself, has covered us under the shelter of his wing, has given us shelter in his shadow, has protected us, has loved us, has provided for all of our needs. He is the God who loves us. So when he set us apart, he called us to himself. So he's done all that for us so that you may proclaim his excellencies of God who called you out of darkness into his light. In other words, that we are to make an impact. And the only way we can make an impa impact on the world around us is if we're available. That's what Peter's talking about here, or, or the Holy Spirit through Peter, is that you're a chosen. It's just a reminder. It's like a shock to the system. It's like the defibrillator hitting your spiritual life and saying, listen, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're set apart by God as his possession to be available to love people, reach people, encounter people, engage people, whatever, whatever. Be available. Be available for God so that he can use you. Number two, identify distractions. Well, I had some distractions this morning. I quickly identified them. Verse 40 says, but Martha, see, so Martha, Martha was, was, goes to Jesus and, and she, she's made herself available. She opened up her home, opened up her resources, opened up her, her, her food and her availability to serve Jesus. And, and his disciples. But Jesus, when she was upset that Martha, that her sister Mary was there sitting at the feet of Jesus, she goes to Jesus and says, Lord, she's here. I'm there. Can you help me out? Tell her to come here. Martha was distracted with much serving, the Bible says. Verse 40. That the, she was distracted with serving. She was distracted with her availability. Oh man, hold on a second. You just said to be available and now you're talking about Martha's availability. No, it was she was available, but she the, the thing that she was doing in her availability was distracting her. She was distracted and we'll talk more about this, but but she was prepping for the guests. She was getting the meal ready. And these are good things. You don't invite people to your house for a meal. You don't invite the the king of kings and lord of lords, the savior of humanity, the savior of the world to your house for a meal and you don't make him a meal? That was a good thing. She was she was doing what she should, it was appropriate what she was doing. It was a good thing. But in that moment she was missing the significance of what was happening. She was available. She was doing a good thing. But at that moment, the distraction, she was in the distraction of doing the good thing. She was missing the significance of Jesus being in her home, teaching, loving, exposing, pulling the veil back of the kingdom of God. Savior of the world was in her house. And she was frustrated that her sister was not helping. She was so distracted by what she deemed as urgent. You've heard me say, and I've probably stole it from someone else, the tyranny of the urgent. This is a condition that we have in our, in our society today, that we get so overwhelmed by the thing that we, we deem as urgent. Whatever it is, and it becomes the tyranny of the urgent. So we get so wrapped up in it that it completely consumes us. So the very good thing that Martha was doing had so consumed her that she missed that Jesus was right there in her living room. Jesus was right there in her house. The preparations had all of her attention. So the good thing became the distraction. I've often said before, and I, and I say this in my own life, and I say this to, from the pulpit, and I say it to my family, that we have to be careful that we don't allow the blessings of God 
to become distractions in our lives. We have to be careful that we don't start worshiping the blessing. We have to be careful that we don't, that we don't give all of our attention and all of our worth to the blessing. This is why when we, we talk about all the time and we are a Pentecostal church and we believe in the gifts of the Spirit and operation, we believe in miracles and signs and wonders, but when we seek the gifts above, above the, the gift giver or we seek the miraculous above the miracle worker, we're missing it. We're missing it. It's about Jesus, not the miracles. The miracles, the gifts, everything points back to Jesus and authenticates the message of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. That's what the gifts and the miracles are all about. It's about Jesus. It's about the, the miraculous and the gifts to be out, to, to encourage the, the church, encourage the body of Christ, but also to be a sign to the unbelievers that God is real and Jesus is alive. So the distraction will often, the good thing becomes a distraction and it often will change our attitudes and our disposition. And your disposition, whether it be anxiety, and that was what Martha was dealing with in that moment, the anxiousness of, of getting everything ready and getting everything on the table, making sure everything was prepped and ready to go. Your disposition of whether it's anxiety, fear, anger, whatever it is, reveals what has your attention. Because Mary sitting at the foot of Jesus, at the feet of Jesus, she was just, just swallowing up everything he said. Her disposition was peace, was joy, was contentment. So I would, I would say this, this statement to you. I will say this statement to you. That if you find yourself in a constant state of anxiety, constant state of fear, and I'm not talking about there are, there are real sicknesses, there are real things that require help, and I'm not, I'm not speaking those things away or require a healing from Jesus. But if you find yourself constantly anxious about something or anxious or, or in fear about something coming up or something you're in the middle of doing, then I would say that maybe you're giving that too much of your attention. And it's causing that because you're focusing on it and you're dwelling on it and you're, and you're meditating on it and it, it is consuming you. So think about the notifications we get constantly on our, on our smart devices, on our phones. And I was thinking this morning of the notifications that was popping up on here as far as our, our Facebook Live and everything, and how our, what we have alerting us and what we're giving attention to can be consuming to us. I had to, it's like, uh, maybe it was, I don't know if it was a year ago, if it was several months ago, I basically turned off almost all of the notifications on my phone. Because I was getting news notifications literally every minute or less. And it was, and it was like from different, all the different sources. They, it was the same thing from different, it was like uh, such and such is happening, such and such is happening, such and such is happening, such and such is happening. Oh my goodness, such and such is happening. What are we going to do? It, it, we get so consumed by everything that's popping up on our phones and every single notification and every single this. I, I'm, I'm particularly enjoying all the, all the memes that are going out with, uh, with the senator from Vermont and his mittens and the way he was sitting at the inauguration. I'm enjoying those thoroughly, but it's not notifying me anymore because I've shut those things off. I mean, he's everywhere now. <laughs> everywhere. News briefs, stock updates, Weather, some of us are obsessed with the weather. We're so obsessed with what's happening and the, what's going to take place. And I know that there are certain things that you need to know, like if a tornado's coming, you need to take shelter and not be foolish about that. That was new for me, but I've learned. <laughs> you need the certain notifications in your life, but we don't need to be bombarded with the notifications constantly, with current events, with the news, with what's happening. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So, so the Bible, the Word of God is telling us, these are the things that you should, be, should have your attention. These are the things that you should meditate on. These are the things you should dwell on. And I can tell you, all the notifications with all the media outlets that I was getting, the stock notifications, all of that stuff, those things were not any of this. 
I, I, I was looked. I, I was trying to look, and I tried to. Whatever is true, I don't know. Whatever is honorable, no. Whatever is just, no. Pure, definitely not. Lovely, I don't think so. Commendable? If there's any excellence, absolutely not. If anything is worthy of praise, think on these things. And that's when I said, enough. And I shut the notifications off. No more notifications. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, our, our disposition, our countenance, our attitudes would be different if we started to change the notifications on our phone to maybe allowing the Bible to notify us that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. No weapon formed against you will prosper, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Uh, don't, be, don't have no fear. Put your trust in God. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Why aren't we allowing these things to flood our minds and flood our hearts? But we're allowing what's happening in the news media, what's happening in Congress, and what's happening overseas, and what's happening with the dollar, and what's happening with our portfolios. All these things are good, but when they capture all of our attention, they become very bad in our lives. What has your heart? What has your heart? I get notifications every day about from the Bible. Bible verse. I, I don't know. I haven't tried how to set it up where every hour or every half hour it shoots me a Bible verse. I want to figure that out. But I think that's something that we should really think about it. We should really think on and we should dwell on or we should, we should take, uh, let's go old school and let's get flashcards and let's put our, our favorite verses on these flashcards and make multiple copies of those things and plaster them everywhere we go. So everywhere we're going, I go and I look in the mirror and I see uh, the verse that's going to encourage me that uh, uh, put your trust in God. To, to embrace the truths of God's word because we know the Bible tells us that every promise of God, every single promise of God, which is his word, is yes and yes and yes in Jesus Christ. They have all been completed and fulfilled in Christ, so they are for you. So we are, instead of flooding ourselves with what's happening in the world today and obsessing over that and constantly letting that flood our minds and flood our hearts and constantly ingesting all of that, Maybe we limit that to just reading a news brief every day or, or watching a, a half-hour news spot or something and have the word of God flood our hearts and flood our minds. And I guarantee you there will be a change. I can tell you for myself. There was a change in my life when I gave my heart to Jesus. He changed my life, but that change came from me flooding myself with his word and the Holy Spirit activating that word in my life. You can't, the Holy Spirit can't activate word that you haven't engaged. If you don't know the word of God, how can you cling to those promises when you need those promises? So set up your devices or whatever it is that you use to notify you of God's promises for your life what has your heart what has your attention what are you giving your worth to because that is what you're worshiping I'm not worshiping Fox News CNN MSNBC any of them I'm not I'm not worshiping those things anymore I worship Jesus he has my attention and anything that interferes with that attention, I want to remove or, or kick down a notch. What has your heart? Because I'm telling you, like I tell my, told my kids since they were little, like I've told every, every congregation I've ever, I've ever had the opportunity to share with, that if we don't control our inputs, what comes into our souls, into our minds, into our hearts, and into our lives, our eyes, our ear gates, whatever it is, if we don't control our inputs, that whatever we bring in will come out of us. No matter how righteous you think it is, if it's not God's word, it's not righteous. Number three, choose the best. So remember how I said that these were all good things. Martha was not choosing terrible things. She was not choosing bad things. What she was doing was good. She was providing for her Savior. She was, she was making the meal. She, can, she was doing all that. But she missed because that became a distraction. It became the tyranny of getting it done that she missed, that Jesus was in her home just, just giving her the words of life. 
So choose what's best. In verse 42, after Mary confronts, after uh, uh, Martha confronts Jesus, Jesus responds to her and says, Mary has chosen the good portion. Mary chose what was good. And we know when Jesus refers to good, it's different than, you know, how you doing? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. It's not like that. When Jesus talks about good, he's talking about holy, complete, righteous. It is, it is what we would consider the best from God's perspective, the best. So we need to choose what is best. So what does that mean? Not focusing on the distractions, not focusing on, on what we're, we're, we're dealing, not giving all of our attention to some things that are good or some things that we need to be aware of or some things that we need to be concerned about, things that we should be involved in. And not letting that steal all of our attention. So I think of, I think of a, an account in scripture which is incredibly powerful. Paul and Silas are arrested. And they're brought to the jailhouse. And they're arrested for, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are brought to this prison. And you have to understand what the ancient world prisons look like in, in, in ancient Rome. It was deplorable conditions. Think about a hole in the ground that they dug out, and, they, and inside that hole, they, they, they dug out caverns and cells, uh, not necessarily cells, but just like this hole, this pit, where they would chain up their prisoners. They would chain up their, uh, chain, up, chain them up, ball and chain the whole bit, chain them up and chain them all together, and then throw them in this hole. So where you had, where you had ridiculous moisture, all kinds of vermin and everything, it's just deplorable conditions. That's something that will be hard for us to not focus on. Come on, just me. So I don't want to be thrown in a hole and locked up in chains and wait there to rot. I, I can guarantee you Paul and Silas didn't want that either. What did they choose to do? Acts chapter 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So now they've got a captive audience. <laughs> Chained up together instead of them oh this is miserable this is awful and it was and they could have instead they chose to praise God praise remember I talked about praise before they they chose to outwardly praise and expect express their adoration to God their love for God declaring his his goodness in their lives how do you declare his goodness in your lives when you're in a hole for preaching his gospel because their hearts belong to God, not to their circumstance. As awful and as pitiful as it was, they chose to praise. They chose to choose the best. Not choose the actual. The actual was they were, they were tied up and it was bad. They chose the best because they served the living God. They served Jesus Christ, who was alive, who died for their sins. So regardless of what happened to them in this life, they knew they had an eternity in the presence of God Almighty because of Jesus Christ. They chose to give him praise for that. They were singing for that. And what happened? As you read that passage of Scripture, as you go on, and you see what, 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 what comes of that, what takes place? The foundations of that hole started to shake. And everything started to rattle. And I can tell you, Paul and Silas kept singing, kept praising, kept worshiping their God. Kept giving him, their, his, giving him all of their attention, not the attention of what their circumstance was. While everybody else started to panic, started to fret, started to be scared of what's going to happen. We're in this hole and now the hole is going to swallow us up. But it was God moving in power. And that place started to shake. And all the chains, not just Paul and Silas, all the prison chains fell to the ground. What did they do? They got up and they ran. No. When the jailer heard, the one who was in charge of the hole, heard what had taken place and saw that the chains were, were, were now on the floor, that they were now disconnected, was immediately going to kill himself. Because he knew that the punishment was going to be death, so he didn't want to deal with the torture because the Roman Empire was a vicious punisher of crimes. But Paul and Silas said, Just wait, stop. Don't kill yourself. We're still here. We didn't run away. You want to know what happens 
when we give God all of our attention. Miraculous things happen, but it wasn't just the chains falling off. That was just something small. You want to know the miracle that took place here? Everybody gave their lives to Jesus. The, the, the prisoner, the jailer, they all got saved. They all saw the miracle working power of God in the chains, but they saw most of all the joy in these two prisoners who were beaten and shackled for Jesus Christ. I wonder how many, how many of us would choose the best in that situation. We would choose the practical. We would choose the obvious. We might choose uh, the circumstance, and we would focus on it, and we would dwell on it. You want to know what happens when the prisoners dwell on their circumstance? They start to become overwhelmed and fearful, and they start to be completely distracted like we talked about. But when you choose the best, you make room for God to move on your behalf. You make room for God to show himself incredibly loving, incredibly powerful. God used their awful situation to extend his love to more people. Royal priesthood, holy nation, set apart by God for himself to declare the excellencies, the power, the majesty, and the love of God. That's what Paul and Silas did. So I was challenged, I'm challenged this morning, and I would imagine you're challenged as well. What has our hearts, what has our attention? Because Jesus is knocking at the door. Are we going to let him in and give him our attention? He doesn't just want a, a section in your day on your calendar. He wants all of you. He wants all of your attention. He wants all of your attention. He wants us to acknowledge his worth in our lives. Would you stand with me this morning? Three keys, let's say, to unlocking the power of worship in your lives. Be available, identify distractions, choose the best. Father, this morning, we're challenged as usual by your word, but we recognize the Holy Spirit working in this. Father, I'm tired. of so many things capturing my attention. And I say that as though it just happens. Father, I recognize this morning, we recognize this morning by your word that we allow it to happen. Things happen. Things awful, things that are great, things just, just happen. We live in a sin-cursed world and sin breaks stuff. We know that. But that doesn't give us license to, to, to worship it, to give it all of our attention. So this morning, we, we hit the reset button as, as you are calling us to arms, as you are calling us to your arms, to your love, to your grace. Lord, you want us to acknowledge your worth in our lives. Help us to be available. In other words, to give, to completely focus, give, give our attention to you and, and not to the other things. Help us to, to be available for the things, for, be available to you all the time throughout our day, not just the calendar schedule. Help us to identify the, the very things that are distracting us in our lives, the, the, the good things, the, the bad things, all of the things that are distracting us, that are, that are pulling our attention from you and giving it to these things. Help us to, to, to identify the things that are, that are completely, completely uh, capturing our attention and, and we are giving it all of our, our, of our attention. Help us to identify those things and if we need to remove them, help us to remove them. Give us the strength to do that. If it requires us to make some changes in our life, then so be it. Because the good things or the terrible things that are distracting us, 
is distracting us from you, the very best thing. So help us to choose the best, Lord. Help us to always be aware of, of, our, of what's happening around us, that we would make a, a conscious choice, spiritually uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to make a choice to choose Jesus, to choose you every single time. And that is what is best. What is best are the things of God, that it's not, it's not my will, Lord, but it's your will be done. On earth, inside us as earthen vessels, as it is in heaven. We love you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that our countenance, our, our dispositions would reflect this change in our lives. That we wouldn't be so anxious about a, something specific, a, a situation or something that's coming up, that we would deal with it as we deal with it by the power of the Holy Spirit, but we would, we would allow your word to flood our hearts and our lives. We love you, Lord. Pray your blessing. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I, I want to ask this question, as I do every week. If you're here this morning and, and you have not given your life to Jesus, you haven't made that decision to follow him, I want to give you that opportunity to do that. Or maybe, as I, as I often say, maybe you, you did at one point, but, but maybe you haven't been living for Jesus or, or you never fully surrendered your life or gave him control of your life and you want to rededicate your life. The first step of acknowledging God's worth in your life is giving your life to him through Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you want to give your life to Jesus, as I say all the time, you're not joining this church, you're joining Jesus. If you're here in the worship center and you want to do that with nobody looking around, every head is bowed and every eye closed, would you just slip up your hand? You slip it up, I'm not going to call you out, I will not embarrass you, I just want to include you in this prayer. Yes, I saw that. Anyone else? Would give your life to Jesus or rededicate your life to Jesus. If you're online and you want to make the decision to follow Jesus or rededicate your life to Jesus, I'm going to encourage you to join us in prayer. The Bible says, make this. It's not some, some insurance policy prayer. This is a life-changing prayer. It's the, it's the stepping off point of getting into a relationship with Jesus. Let the words that we say be the condition of your heart or, or what you believe in your heart. Repeat after me. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I recognize that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, thank you for being my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I give you complete control of my life. Come into my heart. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for loving me. Amen. Let's give God praise for those that gave their life to Jesus. Bring it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're in here and you prayed that prayer, whether you raised your hand or not, and you made that decision, I want to give you something. See myself or David after service. I want to put something in your hands. If you're online and you made that decision to follow Jesus, email us at prayer at victorychurchmo.com. We want to send this to you as well. What, a, what an awesome day to, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What an awesome day to be in God's house. Amen? I want to speak a blessing over you. Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you, church.